Um, hello, all. My name is David, and I run a small design workshop called Technofrolics. We build computer-controlled dancing artworks and interactive science museum exhibits for people all over the world. And I'd like to share with you today both some of the things we make and also to discuss hidden assumptions and how hidden assumptions can dramatically shrink our world and dramatically shrink our possibilities from what otherwise might be doable. And <clears throat> one of the reasons hidden assumptions are particularly of interest is if you can see past them, you can see new worlds in an instant. And that's very, very exciting. Um, I started Technofrolics in the late 80s um, out of a mixture of enthusiasm and desperation. Enthusiasm because I saw the possibilities for technology in the service of art, drama, and human connection as being really, really exciting. And not many people were doing that at the time. Um, desperation because I embraced connection with people, emotions, and playing with the same part of myself and with the same intensity and respect as I did physics, math, and engineering. And living in a world that almost completely segregated those two left me feeling both disoriented, isolated, and, and quite lonely. So I really wanted to fix that. I was basically faced with a devil's choice at that point of either embracing technology but living in windowless rooms in the basement filled with expressionless white men who decided, who had relegated their body and emotions to second class citizens, citizens or being with people, who, including importantly women, who were emotionally sensitive, relationally focused, happy, centered in their body, but knew almost nothing about technology. And, I, and that was not a good choice. So I started Technofrolics in part to stay sane-ish and build a home. <laughs> okay. um, I'd like to show you one of the first things made um, by myself and my little team at Technofrolics. Um, it's made out of iron dust in a magnetic field choreographed to music. And I'm just going to play a short video here. Here's some people enjoying it at the Singapore Science Center. And uh, here are some fabric banners. These are computer controlled fabric elements that are also choreographed. This was at a dedication ceremony for a new MIT building a few years ago. I'm just giving you a sense of the kind of things that are made. Now, one of the um, things I'm both proud of and want to share with you because it's relevant to other parts of the talk is the fact that the iron dust, which was built 25 years ago, is still being installed in science centers worldwide and just won three Editor's Choice Blue Ribbon Awards at the New York City Maker Fair. Um, the reason I mention that is the fact that that's the case suggests that it embodies something human as opposed to being a technological gimmick because the technology has advanced so much in the last 25 years it's almost unrecognizable yet the dancing iron dust piece has about the same response now as it always did. And the reason it came into being at all is an assumption that everyone made around the time I made it that I didn't make, which was that technology was not well suited for emotional expression, drama, and connection with people. It was suitable for, quote, practical applications, whatever that means. And I want to give a couple of examples to highlight how much that was true. I mean, and, and really how deep it was. One of them is, no matter when I showed it, and this, this I'm mostly talking about its history rather than more recently, 
in the middle of a crowd of people whose faces look like the people at the Singapore Science Center, grandmothers, children, physicists, dancers, all completely delighted and animatedly talking, someone would say to me, why did you make it? What's it for? Okay, and I was like, what do you mean, what's it for? Like, that was like asking, what is a smile for? I was dumbfounded. Um, but then I began to realize that people's association with technology being for emotionally sterile practical applications was so entrenched that they asked that question out of that perspective. So I started flipping the question on its head and using a different medium of expression. I said when a novelist spends months to years developing the subtle nuances of a fictional character, what's that for? Okay, at least to get people thinking about why are they making different evaluations and assumptions about technology versus any other medium of expression. The second thing that would happen all the time is that um, the motion control tools, like I wanted to animate things. So I would want to do something like show inquisitiveness followed by startled recoil. The way a dog would behave if it's sniffing at a turtle and then the turtle suddenly sticks its head out and the dog recoils. I had golden retrievers, so I saw this kind of thing. And um, so I would try to find a way of controlling, say, motors. And you can, a motor is, you know, when you do dance choreography, a motor is fine for such a thing. It's controlling the motion. That's all choreography is. But none of the motor controllers would allow things like inquisitiveness or startled recoil. Um, they had all been designed for high speed assembly of uh, machines. Things like, uh, where, where, sorry, where precision and speed were really the important aspects. And no one making cars cared one whit about tentative or exuberant robotic car assembly. Okay? So they were horribly difficult to use. Um, now, I'd like to um, say again that all of this ties into this idea of what are one's assumptions. And Assumptions tend to shrink our world, and they shrink our world intellectually. They shrink our world in personal relationships. They shrink our world in every possible regard. And you often don't see the cage you're in. But one of the reasons it's so cool is that if you do see the cage, you can simply walk out of it. So rather than having spent 50 years working on something incrementally, you simply can see what the hidden assumption is, see where you're trapped, and simply walk past it. And that, in the same way that if you use a microscope or a telescope to look at the natural world, it changes in an instant. And it, it opens up whole new worlds, and it's beautiful on top of that. Um, all right, so let me now show you some other items we make that are related to this. So one of the assumptions people made about video, this was back in like, well, we developed this back in around 1999. Um, people made the assumption that video is a produced experience played linearly in time forward. And that's what everyone treated video as. And we decided, well, what if we don't make that assumption? What if we make the assumption that video can be played backwards or forwards at any speed whatsoever from stop frame to billions of times normal rate in non-contiguous frame sequences all over the place and most importantly, that this can be done with incredible smoothness and liquidity so that when you're exploring natural phenomena, you, get a, you don't lose the kinetic dynamics of the phenomena. In fact, I'm very sorry I don't have Gary's toads, uh, but you'll see why in a moment, but we do have other things. So let me um, just first of all show you the environment in general. Um, and this is something we make. Most of the work is in the software, but we do build these things. They're called the Frame Glide Spin Browser Video Explorer. <coughs> okay, so this allows moving through video footage at absolutely any speed with no distortion whatsoever. So you can go backwards and forwards and explore phenomena, normal frame rates, high speed, and at any rate of your choosing. So it puts the magic of time lapse and high-speed video into the user's control. This, by the way, is milk on a vibration table that we filmed in the studio, and it's pretty wild, huh? It's really beautiful. Anyway, and similarly with time lapse, let me just quickly show you a time lapse piece, and then I'll move on here. So just as we were showing high-speed video there, you can equally well explore backwards and forwards in time 
with time lapse. And you'll notice there's no temporal stutter, no pixelation. And we have these in hundreds of museums around the world with content ranging from birds in flight to enormous tours across diverse landscapes to colonoscopies, which I didn't bring to spare you. Uh, <laughs> One of the more popular exhibits in Canada is on, because they have agricultural areas. We work with the Ontario Science Centers on cows, and they have cows pooping, and the kids running that backwards, okay, <laughs> is uh, one of the more popular things. <clears throat> so uh, in any event, um, if you would ask me when I started doing this, doing high-tech art, would I be doing a lot of colonoscopy-related things? I would have said no, but I would have been wrong. Um, <laughs> In any case, um, the other thing it changed is the fact that because you can move through content enormously fluidly, it changed another assumption, which is that video content lengths should roughly match the attention span of viewers. And in museums, that meant two minutes. We now have increased that by over a factor of 1,000. We have museum installations with over 24 hours of video at 30 frames a second. These are terabyte-sized data files where the visitors don't watch them through. They explore making their own discoveries of animal behavior and other diverse things. We, you know, we have like live capture cameras on animal tanks so people can see the last 24 hours of the interactions between fish and starfish and all different time scales. And they can explore that on their own. Um, all right, another, another assumption that people can make also related to um, video. And, and by the way, some of this is changing now, but, but not as much as it could. Um, when you're looking for patterns in enormous size videos, the idea is you decide on what you're looking for, you computationally try to find it in the video, and then you review the results. The problem there is deciding the question and getting the results has the computation step in the middle. And that means the answers may take weeks or months to get. If you instead flip that and you take the video and analyze it for all kinds of things and create metadata for it, and then ask the questions you want, and then get the results, the time goes from weeks to sub-second timing for many questions you might ask. So let me just quickly show a bit of that here. This is a random video I took uh, driving around Somerville, which is where my studio is. Not particularly interesting, but I just want to show you what the source is. In under one second, by simply red thresholding the frames, very simple, I'm not doing anything fancy here, we get all the red cars from that entire scene. Again, this is sub-second. So in a meeting, you could say, well, what are the red cars look like around Somerville? I'm not saying that's a particularly interesting question, but it gives you an idea. Then you can say, no, that was the wrong question. Really, what we care about are the blue cars. And it, okay, and that's all done in, in fractions of a second. So imagine you ask the question, what would um, primate behavior, social and otherwise, look like after feeding events? Um, excuse me. Yeah, or, well, or, or um, what would... Uh, a classroom look like in peaks in the audio and then 10 seconds before the peaks and 30 seconds after. Maybe 10 seconds before the peaks in audio in a classroom where there's an outburst, you find this one kid who's always tugging on the hair of the girl in front of him and that's what starts off the whole thing. But you don't see those patterns unless you can filter for them. Um, and I'm going to show you a little more, <coughs> excuse me, filtering here. So these are high-speed water balloons. This is the source video. Here the assumption is that strobing, you know strobe lights where you see like a frozen water droplet? How many of you have seen that in a science center? A lot of people, right? They're assuming the events are high speed and that they're evenly spaced in time. Suppose we don't make that assumption. <coughs> Suppose instead we say the spacing of the intervals can be anything at all and they can be spread out over months because things that are very spread out are just as hard to see patterns in as things that are extremely fast that you can't see at all. They're both very hard. It's, you only see patterns when you see the time scale that's your time scale. So here are water balloons. This is the source. They're fun. They have little faces on them. Now what we're doing next is we're going to filter for detecting the balloons entering the scene using a... Uh, this doesn't really matter, but the technical details, we're, ch we're looking for rate of change of contrast of the scene and looking for a threshold in that. And so it detects all the balloons as they enter scene. Now, that's not so interesting by itself, but we can use that same detection and look at them 
a little bit later. We're going to look at them 60 milliseconds later than the detection of them entering. And now we have the landings. Okay, so here are all the comparative landings of the balloons, okay? And you can now see patterns that you would never see otherwise. And if we delay it slightly farther by 85 milliseconds, imagine these are toads, okay? <laughs> thank, thank you for going first. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now you see all the recoil events of the balloon. And all of this is doable. Once you have the video, you can ask all of these questions and get answers in under two seconds. So it's extremely fast, whereas if you were computing this in the other order, it would take forever. I'm almost out of time, so I want to share with you something else that is a thing we're really excited about. I'm completely sleep deprived trying to get a better demo than I'm going to show you now for this show, and I'm, I'm glad I was at least passively coherent. I wasn't sure at all in the beginning because um, I'm totally like dead. Okay, but what we're, here's another assumption that <coughs> Video is primarily within the arts for showing movies. But video actually within the arts is an enormously rich data set with very, very powerful tools to create it. By video, I'm including particularly animation, like a video editor can create animations and animation editors can do that as well. And what we're working on is a way that anyone who can make a video representation of a choreography we take that video and translate it into a real data stream that controls physical artworks. Um, I'll talk about that more, but let me just show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to play a little video just of the dancing iron dust. I wanted to show you guys motors and lights, and we have that working now in our studio, but I missed it by a day, and I'm sleep deprived. So hang on a second. Uh, in any case, maybe we can do it again sometime. All right, so here is the environment and the colored circles. It's looking at the grayscale of the color circles, and that's directly mapped to the electromagnet strength choreographing this. And so anyone who can choreograph the right-hand pattern there in a video editor can choreograph the dancing iron dust sculpture now. Now, when I started doing this, it took 40 hours a minute of horrible coding where the idea of conveying inquisitiveness using low-level coding, it's a nightmare that I do not want to wish on anyone. This has the potential of speeding up choreography by a factor of a 1,000, making it available to people not only who are hardcore nerd coders, but anyone who can use a, a, an anim animation tools. And I'm hoping it'll create a whole new ecosystem of choreographers, sculptors, and the whole maker community, which is building all these affordable mechanized and lit up devices. It'll allow decent choreography. Doing bad choreography is easy with almost any tools. Doing good choreography is very, very hard. And we now have, I'm estimating here, 50 million plus tools like Adobe Premiere, After Effects, Maya, 3D Studio Max. These things were developed by hundreds of people over a decade. These are video editors and video animation tools. Those can now be used to choreograph 3D kinetic sculptures. Anyway, uh, I sort of lost that, ran out of time to discuss hidden assumptions more, but let me just say they're everywhere, they're all around us, and if you can see them, you can walk through them, and they're very, very cool things there. So thank you. <laughs>